will stand before Jesus and give an account of your life. It's the fear of the Lord that actually delivers the end time church from the corruption of the culture around them. When I slip out of my mortal body, I shall render an account for everything I thought, everything I said, everything I did, and I live with that awareness now, and that's the fear of the Lord. Welcome to the Father State. I'm Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. Uh, the Father State is now on locals.com. So click the link in the description to support our work there. And I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. I have with me um, Lance Wall now. And Lance is a speaker, author, CEO of the Lance Learning Group and the host of Lance Wall Now Show. And Lance, thanks so much for coming on. I've been looking forward to this, Jesse. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate it. So are you a, a pastor? No, I used to pastor. I pastored for like around 20 years. Businessman, pastored, and then I moved to Texas and began uh, doing media. So we got a media company. Nice. And so you don't pastor anymore? No, sir. Amazing. So... Um, my, my show is called The Fallen State. Do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? Yes, human beings are in a fallen state, and, uh, and that explains a lot of the dysfunction of humanity. And, what, and, and how would you describe, for those who don't know, what is the fallen state? Well, the fallen state is God designed man with a capacity to have dominion and creativity and order in the earth. And when man fell away from God in the garden, which is the, the story of man's choice to do his own thing rather than what God was instructing him to do, he produced chaos, a disconnection between him and God. And instead of being able to be led accurately by the uh, voice of God, he became dominated by his senses and began to be ruled by his own rationalization regarding his appetites and drives. And so very quickly, the world became rather primitive instead of advanced. Amazing. And so can we overcome that fallen state? Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's part of the, uh, the beauty of the, the whole Bible narrative, that it is possible for people to submit themselves to God and develop a mastery over that inclination to self-destruction by asking for God's help and God's grace. And, and as they do that, there's a greater insight and understanding of what God's will is and how to cooperate with it. And when you do it, you have a more blessed and prospered life. How can we know for sure that we have overcome the fallen state? Can we know for sure right here on earth that we have overcome the fallen state? Yes, yeah, I believe is I believe that the that's where the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel makes so much sense, Jesse, because man in his own nature is basically deceived. He doesn't know he's fallen. That's why Jesus said mankind is like a lost sheep. You know, the sheep is wandering, doesn't even know it's lost. It's wandering around, it doesn't know how to get home either. So when the gospel comes, it it begins the process of challenging us to submit ourselves to the realization that there is a power that is greater than us and that there is an ultimate truth that we're accountable to and that we'll be judged by that standard. And if we invite the creator of the universe to come in to our hearts, forgiving us for our sins and taking up residence inside of us, then we can be led moment by moment into a greater degree of, uh, of harmony with what the spirit of God wants to see happen in our lives. And I don't know if you ever read any theology from like uh, evangelists like Charles Finney, but these are great revivalists who had much greater success in the 1800s, I think, than we have today. And they dealt a lot on this subject. They, they weren't just a pat on the head kind of conversion therapy where you got people nowadays that come up and answer an altar call and they go back and keep living the way they were living. Well, Finney would say that person hasn't been changed. They haven't been converted because to Charles Finney and to some of these earlier, deeper theologians, the real change is when you move from selfishness 
to benevolence or when you stop living for yourself and begin living out of the out of a desire to do what is right rather than do what is convenient to do what is true rather than do what is pleasant and that uh, and that voice of the spirit that conscience that can become cultivated by god will start to refine your trajectory and you'll catch yourself moving more from self-interest to moving into doing what you need to do and ought to do. And that's the moment when you start having the peace of God really manifest in your life. And so do we have to be right in order to do right? Or can we do right and not be right? Well, that's a, that's a great point. Now, Finney, I'm just reading this today. Finney would say that the, uh, the character of an action is derived from the motive. So if I, if I pick up a toy pistol and I accidentally shoot you, well, I may have murdered you, but I wasn't intending to. It wasn't something I was desiring to do. The motive is what gives something the character. And so a person who is motivated, let's say, by feelings, I feel really, bene- I feel really generous, and they give out of that generosity, are they really giving out of something which is a choice of the heart, or are they doing it because of the emotion in the moment? So what Finney was saying, which is a really powerful thought, is that the character of an act is derived from the motive behind it. And until the heart has been turned over to God and been given to the Lord, the the primary drive of even the most religious activity is selfish. And the Pharisees were his biggest problem. They were religiously motivated people, but their hearts were not right. So the character of an act is derived by, by the core of the motive, and the motive must be transformed. Being is more important than doing. Yeah. And if your being is right, your doing will be aligned with it. Amazing. I, um, um, I've noticed that all human beings are possessed. And they're possessed by a demonic spirit of the imagination. And that all thoughts are all lies all the time about anything. And that's why God told us to bring every thought into captivity and that my, sh- my, my children shall know me by my voice, and his voice is a voiceless voice. Can you explain that? No, I think, I think you're absolutely that, right. But if you, if you push that, Jesse, to its logical conclusion, then we should ask ourselves, how come we don't see more casting out of devils? Because the reality is, I agree with you, I think we are probably one of the most civilized, demonized cultures in earth history, which means we have, we've we become so accustomed to our devils that we've actually created a culture around it. So these folks, now imagine this. I was listening to a young lady the other day on TikTok. Somebody shows me this. I was on a TV show, actually, and they played it. And, the, and this girl says, well, I have a female body, but I have a male soul. In other words, there's a voice talking to her, telling her she's a guy. It's a masculine spirit that comes into her female body, and she feels like she is a man trapped in a woman's body. And I said, I'll tell you what, if that is what I think it is, that's a spirit, a demon that's going into her because she's in agreement with it. And then when it's in her, it's talking to her, and she's thinking she is her identity is wrapped up in the demon. If the demon says, I'm a man and you're a woman, she feels like she's in the wrong body. Yeah. I said, when she gets becomes a believer, Jesse, that devil's got to cast it, get cast out, or that devil's got to get broken off. You're go, we're gonna see, we're gonna have to see a real um book of acts kind of deliverance coming to the people that are coming into the church. The interesting thing about that story, I didn't see it, but if the devil told her that she feel like a man, a male, then he's still lying to her. First of all, she's not a male. Secondly, she doesn't feel like a male because there is no feeling to being a male. You just are a male, but there's no feeling to it. So he's lying to her about that as well. Right, which explains why you can have uh, a female uh, spirit or a demon go into a male, a boy, and say you're a girl. Yeah. You know, I don't even know if there's a theology about gender and the demons. All I know is the feeling's a lying feeling, and the <laughs> voice is telling the boy the wrong thing. Yes. And I, and I heard another story. This one really started me. I mean, I'm, I think this is going to start a firestorm if people start hearing this conversation, because their hair will go on fire. Oh, you're saying transgenders are the devil? Well, 
I heard this one story about this New York councilwoman, and I read this in the New York Post, and I verified it with a friend of mine, that uh, she had the, she and her husband had a had a, a daughter who was in a classroom with a teacher who was teaching the children that they may be in a different gender. And she started to have a struggle with her identity. The mom and dad took her out of the class and did deliverance over her, took authority over that voice, and she was happily reconciled to being a little girl again. But had she stayed in that class, the spirit operating through the teacher would have continued to get into that girl so that she would have ended up picking up that spirit. Amazing. What's it? I noticed that before I move on, I noticed that most people, I don't, I rarely do I hear people talking about the possession of the mind that the devil dwells in thoughts and emotions because you can't have the emotion unless you have the thoughts. Uh, and the only way to overcome it is that salvation is of the heart. So you have to overcome the anger of the heart, which is of the devil. Then the light of God will destroy the imagination where the devil dwell, because there are definitely wicked spirits dwelling in the imagination. Why don't we hear more talk about that? Well, I, th I think you're, uh, I think it's because the gospel you're talking about is going, is inevitably on a collision course with wrong thinking in the contemporary world around us. And I think a lot of people are trying to avoid that conversation. But uh, where the Apostle Paul says, taking every thought captive yeah. to the obedience of Christ, I remember doing a word study on that, taking every thought captive, and it literally means in Greek, to seize a thought by the point of a spear, as though you have a spear embedded between the shoulder blades, moving a prisoner forward. We're supposed to examine our thoughts and cause them to serve us rather than becoming taken over by our thoughts yeah. and our thoughts. When I see these, uh, I looked at that, uh, what was it, Stanford University, a disgraceful situation where the dean brings in a, a federal judge to come in and talk, and this, this federal judge is coming in there to talk, and these snotty kids and the dean all start to abuse the judge, mock him, she berates him, and then they all get up and walk out. This is a generation that doesn't know how to manage its feelings because it doesn't know how to take its thoughts captive. It becomes taken captive by its thoughts. Yeah, I saw that as well. And, and another dumb thing that that woman said when the, when the judge was speaking up for himself, she said something like, you don't talk, you have to respect a black woman or something like that. I'm like, what the, you have to, <laughs> <laughs> what does that even mean? You know what I'm saying? Some dumb woman <laughs> but, telling you got to respect her because she's black. Can it well, get any worse than that? That's how come they didn't invite you to come talk at uh, Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you are a Christian, am I right? Yes, sir, I'm a Christian. And so what's important to you? Well, you know, the, uh, it's a great question. It's a great philosophic question. What's important to me? Uh, I've, I'm 66 years old, Jesse, and so I've... Um, I developed the theory of the case. Uh, that's what lawyers call it. Theory of the case is that culture is shaped by uh, influencers. Influencers occupy these gates of influence and that there's seven areas. And what's important to me is that the church, family, education, government, business, media, and arts, that in those arenas, that we begin to raise up courageous thought leaders who take their thoughts captive and challenge the thoughts from hell and begin to produce uh, influence in those arenas where culture can be more uh, shaped in a healthy way because that's what's going to create a great nation. And we have allowed those seven arenas to be taken over by unhealthy people because Christians don't engage. I look at my children and I think, well, you know what? I don't need to pick a fight. I've been... I've been, now you, don't, you, you don't know who I am, and I, I don't, I'm not that well known, but I guarantee the left knows who I am. So I'll get hit on Rolling Stone magazine or the Washington Post, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, be, um, I'll have right wing watch and the George Soros hit squads spying on me all the time because they recognize that I believe that Christians, followers of Christ, are called 
to shape the world around us and not just hold out and hunker down and wait for a rapture or to die and go to heaven. So I want to do as much good as I can till I die. And my children are the reason why I fight, because I believe I can retire now and I don't have to be harassed. I'm old enough. I've paid my dues. But uh, I believe for the sake of the next generation, we've got to be more courageous. We've got to do better because we're not winning this battle and we're losing a great nation. Yeah, that's for sure. Why are the Christian men, because if the men led the way, because the men are the light of the world, except they've been turned away from the Father right now, why, why are the men so afraid and so weak? It's unfortunate, isn't it? And, yeah, it and is. I think, I, it's I a think sin. I, <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah, well, when I, you know, so when I look at churches, now I don't know if this is so prevalent, in African-American churches, but I will tell you that in white evangelical churches, they are largely feminine. And um, the women are the biggest tenders in the church. The men are not. And the women will make the man come to the church. But uh, the worship focuses on intimacy, expressions, and experiences, kind of a very feminine thing, which is not that there, there isn't a validity to that, but I mean, if you look at the hymnology or the gospel you know, choir songs. There's a difference between that and the emphasis on intimacy, which is a largely feminine focus. And so I think the pulpits in America began to be shaped by uh, an absence of fatherhood and father figures. And I think that the the devil has unleashed in the last 40 years uh, a, a, an attack on manhood and on fatherhood. And I think it's a Jezebel spirit, to go back to what we talked about earlier. I think it is an, an intentional spiritual attack on men and their role in society. Because when I was just watching, for instance, I'm going through the mall the other day, and I'm seeing, I, I work with a lot of young kids, young, young children that don't have fathers. And some of them do, and a lot of them don't, because my wife's ministry is, works with single mothers. And when I see a dad who has got a kid and he's acting up, and that dad is barking at that kid. Oh, that kid, he's, he's got to pay attention because that bigger guy is there telling him what to do. And I look at that and I go, well, you know what? He will come out better in life because there's a man yeah. who is holding him accountable for his behavior than mom yeah. who's frustrated, yelling, and, and upset with the kids who's pulling her hair out. And I, so I think that there's the pulpit's the same way. We don't have fathers in the pulpit, so Christian men don't have models and we've collapsed in society. Well, it's totally like that in the black churches too. And it has been that way for years now. And that's why the black woman is out of control. Um, it's going to take Jesus Christ to come down in person and, and make the black men and the black women get back together in the right way. Because the black woman is so angry and so out of control now that she would never listen to the black man at all. And so it's been that way for years, and that's why it's so bad. Not only in the churches is it that way, but it's that way in the homes as well. Um, well, well I, I want to ask you a question. You're asking me some great questions, but you're a thinking person, and you got me thinking. Explain to me why it is. Well, what are the sermons that preachers should be preaching if they were going to be preaching more healthy and presenting God as a masculine as well as a feminine, uh, you know, voice in the earth. Number one, they should be dealing with the order of God. God in Christ, Christ over man, man over woman, woman over children. Because uh, uh, most people don't accept that. They don't hear it and they don't know about it because it's not being taught in the home. And number two is that we must be born again, salvation is of the heart. Because now they are pushing anger as a religion, and anger is not of God. There is no anger in God. He is all love all the time. He is not an emotional God. He, he's not up and down and feeling. He's just the same all the time. And in him there is no fear. So that men must be born again of the Father. They must return to the Father. Because until they return to the Father, the woman will rule and as you know, every time you listen to the woman, you're going to suffer. You, a man has no been to listen to a woman unless he listens to her about evil because women of their nature being evil until they are born again of the father, they can pick up evil all the time. 
So the man can hear, oh, you better watch out for that woman or you better watch out for this. But other than that, a man should never take advice from a woman. He will always suffer. It was taught. It used to be taught that way growing up. But because the women have taken over the homes and the schools and everywhere, men are afraid to teach that now and they want money. So they're not going to tell you what's going on with the woman because women don't want to hear the truth about themselves. The hardest thing in the world, the last thing that a woman want to hear is the truth about herself. And men are afraid to tell her because they're afraid of mama. They have not been born again. They have not overcome the spirit of the mother. And so they're still afraid of women. And then other issues, abortion and all that, because if men were in control, there would be no abortion, almost none on this earth, because the man is the power. The strength is in the man, not in the woman. We need to get back to that. And that's not happening now in the churches or in the home. Well, Jesse, I got a confession to make, and I, I, I'm not sure where you land on the subject, but just so that <laughs> So I could show this broadcast on my channel and not, not have the women all in an uproar. You know, I got to tell you, there's been times when God spoke to my wife and, and I didn't listen to her because I wasn't hearing God and I got in trouble. And I know, don't go beta on me. But I'll tell you what something. a beta. I knew it, I knew it was going to happen. Listen, listen. Beta to man. I knew it was going to come. Oh, no. I got the beta call. Anyway. <laughs> Listen, so one time I remember I'm getting, my wife says to me, we're getting married up in Rhode Island. And uh, my wife says to me, we were in Philadelphia at the time, we were on staff at a church. She goes, you better tell the pastors here about uh, you getting uh, married in Rhode Island. We're going to go up to Rhode Island and we're going to be moving to Rhode Island and get married. And I said, no, no I'll t I don't worry about it, woman. You let, you let me be the man. First God, then the man, then the woman. She said, I'm telling you, you better talk to the, our, these pastors here or the pastors in Rhode Island, that was it. You better tell those pastors in Rhode Island that we're doing this church in Philadelphia. We're not moving up to Rhode Island yet. I go, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. You trust the man of God. So anyway, sure enough, I was just avoiding having a conversation with them. I kept putting it off because I was thinking, I'll get the right timing on this. Well, they heard it and they got it through the grapevine. And they called me up and they called up me and my wife. They said, it would have been much better if we heard it from you rather than hearing it through people in the church. We wanted you to come up here and join the staff. It's your, you have the right to go where you want to go, but it would have been better protocol if you called us first. And my wife's looking at me, and she's like, did I not tell the man of God to do it, and you didn't do it? Well, I'm letting you know something. There's a case where God was talking to my wife, and I didn't want to hear it, just putting it out there. But why would God tell your wife something but not tell you? He... God is like a smart God. He's all knowing. He's your father. Why would your father go to the woman and tell you that and not come direct? He's not dummy, you know. Oh, no, no, and no. He, you're absolutely right. he knows right. So how he, to communicate. Well, so why would he being, go right to you rather than have somebody else tell you that? Well, that's right. He probably went to me. I'll be honest with you. He probably went to me, and I kept on putting it off because it was inconvenient. I'd do it at a better time. God was saying you better call. And I'm going, oh, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll call. I'll call. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something else. How about Pilate's wife? He's sitting there, got Jesus right in front of him. He's got to make the most important decision of his life. His wife sends him a note. You be careful what you do with this man. I suffered much over a dream. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He puts that aside and goes ahead and turns Jesus over to crucifixion. His wife had more insight on what he than he had. I believe. Who my was own that? You said what who? do you think about that? Who was that? Pilate's wife. Where's Pilate's wife now? I don't know. She probably she probably is on Oprah's show. I don't know where the heck Pilot's wife is. She's probably, she but, did. But, <laughs> so let me ask, speaking of wise, do you rule over your wife? I I do, but I but I don't I don't let, I don't use that language. <laughs> and why not? Well, because we have because I taught her. I led her to Jesus. I led her to the Lord, and I and I taught her, and I taught her the due order of things, so she understands the order in the house. But she also knows, let me tell you something, Jesse, I'm going to tell you the truth. After that incident where I didn't listen to my wife and I, did, I told her, just submit, I'm the man of God. I'll do it in the right time. And then I got embarrassed because they called me. I didn't do it. I didn't obey the Holy Ghost. There are times when we don't obey God. 
And I was wrong, and I was embarrassed by that. Well, get this. I'm, I'm charismatic, so I got a Pentecostal background. I go up there to that Rhode Island church. I eventually went up there, and I went on staff up there, and I'm kneeling down there for my ordination. My wife's kneeling down. The man of God comes down after this incident, and here's what he says to me. He says, yea, and the Lord does say to the man of God, he doth speak to the handmaiden also. And it's like the Lord was reminding me that God does speak to my wife. So my wife, at times, Jesse, will say to me, you know, I think that you ought to be careful about uh, your schedule, and you ought to be taking a second look at some of these people you got around you. And invariably, I've learned that I, for years, honey, you just let me take care of that. God was trying to give me a heads up on something I wasn't picking up on, and he was using my wife to give me that input. I don't think that's a beta male. I think that's a mature man. <laughs> well, you, you, and, and, I said, and I said earlier that women can pick up because of their nature, they can pick up evil real easy, like because they, they're, they're closer to evil than the man is because God is the, the man's God and Satan is the woman's God. And so she, her nature is wicked. And that's why when we are born through the woman, we must be born a second time of the father because all who come through the woman is born through evil. And, 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 and then we're born a second time of the spirit of the father. So they can pick up evil. That's why I said you can, when she's telling you stuff like that, you can pay attention to it. But real stuff has to come from you. Real leadership, real stuff has to come from you because it's, in you and not in the woman. Women were not created to lead. They were created to follow. And if you notice that whenever the woman is leading the home or the schools or the churches or government or police departments or anywhere where she's in leadership, all hell come through. The gates of hell is open. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why we are having... Uh, homosexual being accepted as normal, lesbian, lesbian, and boy body parts and all that stuff been taken off now because the women are taking over and because their heart, their, their uh, spirit is of their father, the devil, they're emotional, they're illogical, and so they are agreeing with the hell coming in because that's who they, they are until they're born again of the father. If men were in control, I guarantee you, these things would not be happening. And, and the woman must return to her father as well so God can give her a clear and a logical mind. Other than that, her mindset is her father, the devil. So be careful what you listen to, man. Amen. And I, do, and I agree with you on the fact that the leadership is supposed to, man's got a responsibility yep. to lead. Yep. And, and that the reason why I think that you've got more women going to church than men is because we don't have more men that are manly in the pulpit attracting men. Or in the home. So women are looking for the love of a father, and instead of getting love of the father, she gets screwed. Well, that's right. And I'll tell you something else which really bothers me. The <laughs> Apostle Paul he gets labeled as a, um, I don't know what the word is, but he, he, he takes a bad rap because he'll say that the devil will go after and take captive silly women who are led by diverse lusts. Yep. And they heap up to themselves teachers. So in the Internet age, I got more, I got more problems that are difficult to deal with because I say I don't pasture but I got nearly a million people in my audience and I got a hundred thousand a day listening to me. So it's almost like rush a miniature rush Limbaugh audience. And I realized I'm kind of shepherding these people, but I noticed something. The women are attracted to internet personalities, the feminine prophetic type guys, the guys that are more, that aren't man, that aren't strong, but they appeal to the women who are taken captive. I think, by the allure, the charm of these internet ministries. And then they're always writing to me, telling me about, you know, they're watching them all day. And I'm thinking, man, what did you, what, how much time do you got every day to be running around just sitting on the internet watching these, everybody talk? Yeah. Le silly women led captive is a literal reality, more so than silly men led captive. Yeah. 
And the reason for that is because, and you probably already know this, but the reason is because man is created in the image of God and the woman is created in the image of man, but now Satan is her daddy. So that spirit in the woman hate the image of God. And so uh, when they can degrade men, and it's not them, but it's that spirit that's working through them, that anger. Anger is evil. So that anger, which is the nature of the devil, hate the image of God. They hate men. And so the devil uses the woman to try to weaken the man, turn him into a drag queen, embarrass him, degrade him, because that spirit of the devil hate the image of God. And men are the image. Even beta males, they're still the image of God. They've just been turned away from the Father. And that's why men have to stand up, return to the Father, so they can help bring the woman out of the hell that she's in. We, we got to see. I'm praying that this Malachi verse happens, where, G, where Malachi says that I'm going to send Elijah who will turn the hearts of the fathers yep. to the children. No, notice it's the fathers, not the mothers. I'm going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to their fathers, yep. lest I strike the earth with a curse. The collapse of the family and the collapse of fathers is the is the indication that we've got drag queens and and transgender contagiousness going on with Gen Zs. And that's what happened to the blacks. Um, they would turn away from their earthly fathers during the so-called civil rights movement. They had been working on the blacks a little bit before that time. But the worst thing that ever happened to the blacks, not slavery, not Jim Crow, not this phony idea of racism, was the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was a social camp to take control of the black. It was socialism. And they, they wanted the so-called leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, all those guys, they wanted to be the head of the people, and they sold the blacks over to the Democratic Party so that because at one time the blacks were voting Republican because men were leading their home. They were Republicans and not Democrats for the most part. But the civil rights movement set the blacks up and lied to them, and they became the leaders, and the government became the daddy, and it just been downhill for black people. The worst thing that ever happened to them is the civil rights movement and abortion. If there had never been a civil rights movement, black people would not be begging and whining and blaming and violent and angry and destructive. They got to overcome that anger and return to the father before things get better. And a lot of people are afraid to say that, especially white people, because they don't want to be called racist. They love their ego. They love their things more than they love what's right. So they won't even tell the blacks the truth. And other blacks are not going to tell them because they're using them for personal gain. It's a spiritual battle. It has nothing to do with color. It has nothing to do with racism. Racism does not exist, and it's never existed, and it never will. It's a spiritual battle. Do you believe racism exists? I I happen to agree with you. I think that I think that I remember um, Huckabee put it perfectly. He said, "In the Bible, the issue is sin, not skin." You know, I travel around the world. I have a passport book of about I don't know seventy countries, and I'll tell you something. I found in every country, people filled with the devil and people filled with God. Yeah. I could go to China and I ran into some communists that would kill me. I ran into the underground church that would die for me. I've been to Africa. I've seen some angry Africans that would kill me. I've seen others that stood up to protect me. And I, and I realized something, how beautiful Jesus is, that Jesus can go into any skin, into any body, and, and there are beautiful nationalities and diversities, Jamaican or, or from India or from Asia or Europe, that I've seen the devil and I've seen God under the skin and in the eyes of humanity. And there's nothing more beautiful than to see Jesus in the diversity of the nations. So I, I believe that racism is clearly a spiritual mechanism of the devil. By the way, what, what, what does the devil do when, when he doesn't have a, a skin tone to try to work with? He'll do it with religion. He'll do it with something else. Yeah. So the, the, the Houthis and the Tutsis, they all look the same. So they just say, well, which tribe are you? Well, you look the same, but that's okay. We're going to kill you because you're a Tutsi. Or if it's in Ireland, are you a Catholic or a Protestant? Well, you all look the same, so I'm going to make the racism 
a religious issue. It's good. Satan is into dividing and destroying. And so wh whatever mechanism he can come up with, he'll come up with. Um, and so you're not afraid to tell the blast the truth? No, I was so ignorant, brother. When I, <laughs> I was, I came into, uh, uh, I met with Donald Trump, right? So the I didn't know. The great white what, hope. Huh? That's the great white hope. Yeah, really, exactly. I met I met with with the Great White Hope up in up in Trump <laughs> Towers, and I was praying. I was saying, "What the heck am I doing here?" And uh, the Lord had me up there. I'm convinced of that. And I came back and and I started praying, and the Lord said, "Hey, I'm going to do something that's going to be very offensive because uh, I'm not going to pick any of the uh, the the popular evangelicals. It's not going to be Cruz. It's not going to be Carson. It's not going to be Huckabee. It's uh." It's going to be the guy from Queens. And I said, uh-oh, my friends aren't going to like this, Lord. The Lord said, you go to the Isaiah 45. I anointed Cyrus to deliver my people, and he was a foreigner. I'm going to bring a guy from the outside to do what my people didn't do. So I said, all right, Lord, it's going to be offensive. First place I went to was Atlanta to go preach. I had no idea the black church was so, so Democrat that they, they weren't Republican. <laughs> I was ignorant because I was not involved with politics. And I went down there to Atlanta at a black church, and I'm preaching. God just told me he's raising up Donald Trump, <laughs> that he's going to be a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. He's not going to pick an evangelical. He's going to pick an outsider, and the guy's going to be Isaiah 45 like Cyrus. I think we can get him saved, but right now that isn't, that isn't the problem. The problem is the church better be, get ready to accept the wrecking ball. Well, you know what? It was so weird because the, a lot of that church loved it. But the leaders came over to me and said, you know, we could vote Republican, but we won't ever tell our people that. And I thought, well, what the heck is this all about? Yeah. You could vote Republican, but you won't tell your people. They said, yeah, some of us even like Trump, but we'll never tell our congregation. They'll kill us. And I, I thought, well, I had my first wake-up call. Yeah. What a mess. I read that you, uh, you predicted that Donald Trump will become president before anyone else, and you were precise about it. Where did you get that understanding from God or common sense? Or how did you no, know that? I'll tell you the truth. I, I, I was, when I came back from that meeting with Trump up, at, uh, up in New York, right? I got my hair sticking up here. <laughs> <laughs> but I came back from that meeting with Trump in New York. I came back and I sat down. I said, well, that was a weird experience. I don't hear God a lot, brother. I'm not one of those people that's hearing God. But all of a sudden I hear the Lord. It's like, like in my ear. Down, that the next president of the United States would be an Isaiah 45 president. And I thought, that must be the devil. I never heard God talk like that. And I remember the Bible verse that says, try the spirits, whether they are of God. So I said, the next president would be Isaiah 45. The 45th president will be Isaiah 45 is what I heard. So I went to Google and I said, I know that spirit's lying because Barack Obama was 44 and he got elected twice. This is how stupid I was. What a he got mess. So he had to be 44 and 45. So I look it up in Google, and Google says that Obama was 44, and he was reelected, but he kept the same 44. The next president's 45. Then I went to Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, whom I have anointed, to go through the tulip gates of Babylon and to break the, you know, the iron bars. And I'm reading this thing, and to undo the belts of his military adversaries. And, the Bible's, and, and then the Bible says, I'm going to do this, though he doesn't know me. I said, whoops, the only candidate that I know that doesn't know him is Donald Trump. Everybody else says they're Christians. He can't, he can't even get, you know, his uh, testimony right. He doesn't know how to fake it. So I knew that it was Trump. I knew then Isaiah 45 is going to be Trump. So I started telling people, I said, now listen, I'm not saying this because I, I believe this is, a, this is not a normal time in history. God is raising him up and religious people won't like him and, and liberals won't like him. And then I said, I put in this book right here before it was even used, Trump derangement. I'm the guy that came up with the term, Trump derangement syndrome. I put Trump derangement in the book in 2015. I said the media is going to end up suffering from an affliction called Trump derangement because they will not be able to swallow this guy's existence. He's going to provoke everybody's devils. Amazing. Um, well, you make a good point in that. We only have a one-party system now. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party is the same. It, the Republican Party is not the party that I joined. It used to be of courage 
and it used to be about God and family and standing up for the country. Now I've noticed that the, not all, not all, but most of the representatives are just like the Democrats. All they do is hold press conferences and pretend that they are going to do something about a situation, but they never do it. I realize that they're in it for the money and for the perceived power. So we really, and I'm a Republican, and we really don't have a, a Republican party. We don't have representatives anymore on this side. No, no, no. I, mean, I just got done doing a Bible study. I said, if you take a look at Jezebel and Ahab, Jezebel is out of control, female energy, witchcraft, intimidation, domination, and manipulation. Yeah. You look at Ahab, it's passivity. It's passive leadership that's selfish. Ahab is the Republican Party, and Jezebel is the Democrat Party, and the two of them are joint on the throne over the American treasury, awarding themselves the money of the hardworking Americans who need to wake up and realize that the Uniparty's got to go. Yeah, two quick questions about that. So you're saying that for right now, you don't think the great white hope Donald Trump would be re re-elected again? I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be too abstract, but barring, remember, he wasn't supposed to be elected the last time. He just freaked them out. So God can do anything. He wasn't yeah. supposed to be there. Now they've, re they've really fortified with ballots and all that stuff and new laws. There's no path to the presidency with the present in the five swing states that the Republicans refuse to address and the Democrats have gained. However, having said that, there is the possibility in the next 24 months of a populist movement, of an uprising spiritually, of the misery index with the incompetence of this, this uniparty financially and militarily, bringing the House down to the point where the people insist on a change so it is possible. If yeah. the pain gets hard and the awakening, the move of God gets strong, we might be able to see mercy show up in two years and give us a four-year fix. Amazing. But it's going to be an act of God. Well, I'm sure hoping for that. Um, let me ask, do you, have, um, do you have perfect peace? I have. I have, it's funny. I have perfect peace. I was talking to you. Have you had? You got to have this guy on for an interview. Um, Wellington Boone. I don't know if you know who Wellington Boone is. Bishop Wellington Boone. He used to do Promise Keepers. He's like in his eighties now. I just talked to him the other week, and I was talking about the Asbury revival. And he challenged me. He's like you. He's a lot like you. He's definitely an alpha male, black alpha male. He comes to me. He goes, "Let me ask you a question. When you hear about revival." And you could, do you have to go to Asbury to go to Revival? I knew it was a trick question because he's like you. He's setting me up. I'm going, well, Bishop, um, I, I would like to go just to see what's going on. He goes, I'm asking you. He said, I had a call with all my pastors today. I said, I asked them one by one, are you in Revival or aren't you in Revival already? And he's, he said, the truth is, if you're walking with God, if you've got perfect peace with God, if you're pleasing God, you are in Revival. If you're not, it's your fault. Get in one. He said, I don't have to go to Asbury to find a revival. I yeah. am in revival. And I thought, well, you know what? What he's saying is important. So my answer to you is I got perfect peace, yes, with God. And I think it's because I'm trying to walk in that revival. Amazing. Do you have anger? I have moments, my friend. But I know that the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Yes. So I have to ask myself, well, I look at what these Democrats are doing, these Republicans are doing. How can I not get angry? I'm watching them destroy my children's future. I get furious. I look at the apathy in the pulpit. We've got dumb pastors that are actually going woke. That makes me angry. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I know it's the Lord. You know why? Because let not the sun go down in your wrath. I feel it because I feel God's agitation with, with man's folly, but it lifts off of me, and I move right back in the flow of what God's got. So I know that I'm experiencing an appropriate emotion but it doesn't control me. I'm experiencing, in a sense, Lot was vexed in his righteous soul day by day by the conversation of the wicked, it says in King James. So I get vexed by what I see as man's self-destruction, but then I come right back to perfect peace. So is anger of God or of the devil? I would say that anger, be ye angry but sin not, tells me there can be a sanctified form 
of uh, of of the of the agitation of God that is not sinful. And I can also see where man's version of anger is self-destructive. But, you know, I'll tell you what, Jesus looked around about them in anger. You take a look at the Gospel of Luke. And what caused Jesus to get angry? He said, this man that has a withered hand, should I pray for him or not? And they wouldn't, and they didn't want Jesus to heal him. And the Bible says, and Jesus looked around them with anger, being grieved because of the hardness of their heart. And then he did something which made them all angry. He said, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand and woo, they all, everybody started cheering and the Pharisees broke up. And the Bible says from that moment, they counseled on how to kill him. But he was angry at their religious spirit. The, the mistake about anger is that because human beings are in a fallen state and they don't have perfect peace. And when they hear the church say that anger is of God, they believe that Christ Christ had discernment. He didn't, he didn't operate through emotions. He wasn't up and down. He didn't feel good or feel bad. He had perfect peace. And in perfect peace, there is no anger. There's great discernment, but you don't feel anything about it. You see what to do and you do it. You, you're able to see it without having to feel it or think about it. And I've noticed that and I'm, any man that has anger is a woman because the anger of a man is that of a woman. He's become like his mother, and women tend, the mothers tend to recreate the children in their image because they impose their will on the kids. They'll, they'll have no patience and all that. And so anger is, is, is of the woman. Any man that has anger is a woman. Do, uh, do you agree? Well, he, he is not a woman. He's a male, but he has the woman's nature. That's why he must be born again of love. Do you agree with that? Well I, well, I understand what you're saying. And the distinction that I would make, Jesse, is I understand conceptually, I agree with you, but the distinction I make is that Christ had a full range of emotions. He could weep going into Jerusalem. I believe that he had a, he even had a sense of humor. And you, and you could see it if you look closely at the way he treated his enemies. And I also believe that the anger of the Lord is, can be a sanctified thing. The, dis, the difference is the Greek word for anger, when it is sanctified, has to do with uh, an emotion that is stirred up or a feeling state that is stirred up even in God. He has a range of righteousness, peace, and joy that comes out of his own disposition. But the wrath is what I think you're talking about. The word for wrath in Greek is a distorted lens that can't see straight. And what I believe we're talking about is that there's a wrath that is, that is stirred up in fallen man. And if you notice something, it never resolves itself. It's constantly distorted, and it never stops. It's a constant low boil. And so we call it anger, but I'm, I'm a big wordsmith. Anger has its own specificity in the Bible, and it could be sinful or it could be just, depending on the motive and what's actuating it. But wrath is a distorted view. It's literally in the Greek. It's lenses that change how you see things. And when the spirit of wrath gets on a minority and they're taught that they're a victim of other people's treatment of them, they can never take everything they see is through those lenses. And it could go in reverse. It could be any kind of, uh, of, of, of wrath. People that hate Jews, people that hate Christians. But wrath is distortionary. And that's, and that's what I think is, is, is the sin nature of anger that is under the control of the devil. Let me ask real fast. I, I'm getting a signal that we uh, kind of run out of time here. Um, real fast, tell the Christians why they should be involved in government. Because a lot of Christians think that they should be. It's the dumbest idea I ever heard. But a lot of Christians think they should not be involved in government. Do you think that Christians should be involved in government? Absolutely. And I why will should build they? My, absolutely. Because for, for a couple of simple reasons. One. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If the church doesn't go into the strong man's house, it can't bind the strong man. The devil in the 20th century has done more destruction and death through the government than through religion. People talk about religion wars, religious wars. 90% of the death that's happened, Stalin, Mao, uh, Nazi Germany, has come through governments. If the Christians do not go up against the gates of hell, then the gates of hell are going to prevail against mankind. You have an obligation to resist the devil. You've got to go into the strong man's house 
and deal with the strong man. The Bible says, I'll build my ecclesia, I'll build my church, the gates won't prevail. How can the church overcome the enemy when it's too cowardly or stupid to go where the enemy's located? I agree. I got to ask, um, the, um, um, there is an attack do you, upon the white man, the white, straight, Christian male oh, yeah. in the Western world. Have you noticed that? Why are oh. white men so hated? And they are blamed, all the losers in society are blaming the white man for it. Why are white men so hated? Because there's so many Christian, white evangelicals that the devil's got to hate them. I mean, that's, you know, they're, 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 a, they're, a, uh, they're a large people group. I promise you, if it was Asians, the devil would hate the large population of Asians that are in America. That, and, and I also, I think there's an important word here. And I think it's Shelby, uh, oh, who was who was it? I'll get his name straight in a second. Uh, it'll come back to me later. There, it was a black economist. Shelby who, Steele. It, is that it? Yeah. yeah, but, yeah. But, and the economist said that the um, he called it white guilt. And he wrote a book on white guilt. And he said, the problem with the American male is that uh, in the United States, the black community has learned how to take the issue of slavery and so beat up the white people for the sins of the Democrats in the South. This is ironic that the Democrats have learned how to use their own sin to beat up all the conservative evangelical Republicans over the head with white guilt. The same way that uh, Douglas Murray has a great book on the strange death of Europe. It happens over there. They're flooded yeah. with Muslim immigration yeah. because, because of uh, Jewish guilt, guilt over what they did to the Jews. And the devil uses guilt as an emotion to manipulate the embarrassment of other people. So the whites are basically a great target to beat up on because they'll passively acquiesce to that spirit of race, hatred, and Jezebel and give the country to the devil because they're afraid of standing up and saying, no, you're wrong, and fighting the racist battle on the front lines. Also, they, they believe, and it seemed to be true, that white men are smarter than blacks and Mexicans and everybody else to the point that they call the white man white supremacy because white people are more creative, they are more innovative in all of the Western world. They, and that's why everybody try to go to the Western world because they're not doing anything in their own countries. And they look over and see what the white man is doing. And the white man let them in. And when they get in, they try to destroy the white man and his stuff. Isn't that crazy? Well, it is crazy. And, and what it really comes down to is not, not even the, the only, here's the odd thing, the only IQ advantage of genetics is um, Ashkenazi Jews, ironically, white European Ashkenazis. And if you think about it, Soros and all these Jewish guys on the left, they're the ones that are creating so much ingenious trouble for us. They, so the, the Israelis have a slight IQ advantage for no reason we can figure out. But the only advantage to white males or white European settlers is the fact that they came from a Reformation base. And whenever you come from God's orientation, you're going to have an advantage over any other orientation. But it's uh, but it's statistically is a fact that the European Reformation base that came to the United States had a certain advantage because of the Bible and literacy. That's all. And that's what makes one race smarter than another. But the truth of the matter is that anyone, uh, black, Asian, or otherwise, who shapes their thinking based upon the Judeo-Christian worldview is going to have a, 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 an advantage over other people who are given to abstract, non-scientific approaches. And it really has more to do with, this, with the gospel than it does to have to do with anything else. Yeah, I noticed that uh, Christianity is the best religion on this side of heaven. And it's an honor, it's a blessing to be a Christian. And I've often wondered, why is it number one? And the reason is, I don't know of any other religions that say that we must repent and be born again. We have to admit that we are wrong so that we can be born again. And I don't know of any other religion that, that says that. And as a result, uh, Christianity is the number one religion on this side of heaven. I agree. 
and it's and it's also uh, it's why Judaism is so unpopular in the Middle East. And Arab, the Arabs are told they can have seventy virgins when they die. <laughs> and when you when you want to become Jewish, you got to get circumcised. I'll tell you right now, that's not a way to start evangelizing. I'm telling you. So I got to heat this up, Lance, and I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. I have to throw you on the hot seat. I thought I was on the hot seat. Okay, I'm ready, Jesse. Let's go for it. <laughs> the hot seat. What is a man? What is a man? A man is that species created in the image of God that has been given responsibility to reshape the world in God's image and to bring forth fruit that will be to God's glory. Should a husband rule over his wife? If a husband fails to rule over his wife, he has exposed his wife to the devil and therefore has been delinquent in shaping his family and ordering matters according to the will of God. In your opinion, what's, what is the most reliable news outlet? Which one? Well, in my opinion, the most reliable news outlet is... Uh, well, it sounds strange. I'm not trying to be religious, but I actually believe that the Bible for me is one of the most predictive tools I've got in terms of anticipating what the news cycle is going to look like. Did you? So I, I go there. Did you take the jab? I did not. Is the earth flat or round? Round, my brother. Are we living in the end times? We are already in the end times. <laughs> Do you know that July is... Why History Month? We celebrate Ju uh, July as White History Month. I, I have to admit that I did not know July was White History Month. Uh, amazing. Yeah, I started July as White History Month five years ago, and we're about to celebrate our sixth year. If the Lord is willing and the creek don't rise, this July. I love that. We're gonna, <laughs> I got to have to interview you for White History Month. That's right. And you know why I started in July? Why? Because July just feels white. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a wonderful interview, Jesse. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. You I'm got another question for me? Let me ask this. I'm almost done here. All Is right. it beta for a man to sit in the passenger seat of a car while a woman is driving? Uh, it is not if the man made the woman drive. <laughs> it's a... Is abortion worse than slavery? Yes. Does a chicken have lips? <laughs> it has a beak. <laughs> is, G is, uh, is Jesus God or the Son of God? Jesus is both God and God's Son, a trinity. Will Ron DeSantis ever become president? Yes, he will if we can get the election fraud fixed. What is love? Love is um, disinterested benevolence. It is the voluntary giving of one's heart and all that one has to the highest well-being of another. Did you have fun? I had the time of my life, my <laughs> friend, because I finally got the beta shout out. <laughs> uh, beta. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for taking on the hot seat and thank you for coming on. Tell the people how to get your books, how to... Uh, follow you, uh, whatever you want to put that. out there. All of my heresies and, that I've done here and taught with Jesse here, uh, Peterson, I like, I like, I like. by the way, I like Jordan Peterson and Jesse Peterson. They're my two <laughs> JPs. Nice. God's Chaos Code. I've written in here all of my heretical thinking. If you think so far that I've been about 90% accurate in what I'm saying, go grab this because I explain why we're in chaos and the way out of the chaos based on the Bible. God's Chaos Code. 100,000 already sold, but I only think 5,000 read it. Try to read it. Amazing. And um, you have a you do a show as well, right? I do. Lance Wallnow's show. We've got like uh, 10 million downloads so far. And I'm going to be putting a lot of this on the show. Right. And I'm gonna show, I'm gonna, you're going to meet my audience, Jesse. So we're going to drive some traffic your way because uh, I want people to hear you more often. Thank but you. You can go to Lance Wallnow's show. You can go to lancewallnow.com forward slash podcast. And I do a daily 25-minute analysis from seven news sources on what I believe as a Christian is happening in the crazy world we're in. 
Amazing. Well, thank you again for coming on. Thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget that the Father's Day is now on Locals.com. So click the link in the description uh, to support our work. Check out our merch. Let me hear from you. Lance, that was amazing. Amazing. Thank you, man. Amazing. I loved it. And by the way, just for my audience, how can people get in touch with you and follow you? They can go to jessaleepeterson.com or rebuildingtheman.com. Rebuildingtheman.com. Excellent. Well, we'll get some lower thirds up and put it on our final uh, broadcast so people can see it. And uh, I want to thank you for this stimulating interview, my friend. I, where do you where are you broadcasting from? Where are you living? Uh, Los Angeles. You're in Los Angeles. We're right in the middle of hell, brother. <laughs> you have you have chosen to set up an outpost right where the Antichrist is. What's going to happen with Newsom? Is he going to run for president? I believe so. I'm not sure, but I think so. I think so too. It I think, like I being think set Newsom up for that. is being groomed. He's got the hair. Yeah. He's got the hair for the left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> I love you, man. We'll talk some more. Love you too, too. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. God bless you, brother. All right.